Hi, I'm Peter Lowen. I'm the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Margaret Levy, who is uh, most recently the uh, outgoing director of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Science at Stanford University, longtime professor before that at the University of Washington, really one of the leading political economists of, uh, of your generation and others. Uh, so it's really nice to have you with us uh, today. You gave a talk uh, for the Kadera Lecture on political equality, what is it and why does it matter? What is political equality and why does it matter? <laughs> okay, so um, political equality as we define it, and there are many possible definitions of it, but we start with the classical definition uh, that comes from some great political theorists like Robert Dahl and Sid Verba, thinking about equal consideration and then trying to figure out what that actually means conceptually and in a way that you can measure it. So political equality for us is not just uh, a statistical form of representation, though it certainly is that. It's not just one person, one vote. It's not just uh, measuring the extent to which uh, there is participation through voting or that there is uh, representation through people looking like you or even being really accountable to you. It's also, so it's not just about who has power over whom and a sort of distributional meaning of political equality, but it's also about the processes and the performative aspect of political equality, the kind of social interactions that make political equality an, an effective and real phenomenon. So for us, political equality is something that uh, is a normative goal we think it is a critical element of a, of a well-functioning democracy and that it's something that democracy also helps to sustain and create. But it's also an empirical issue to understand how it's created, when it's created, where it's created, why it varies across time and place and among populations even within the same times or places. So imagine we were talking, we were watching a conversation between two people one on the left and a person on the left and a person on the right. In a, in a society that was, where there was more political equality it, in, you know, between those two people where relationally they were more politically equal, what would their conversation look like versus in a, in a society where there was less political equality? Well, I think a context would matter there. So if we are talking about um, people who are strangers or relative strangers to each other, um, and operating within a political circumstance where they're debating policies about which they might have serious disagreements, which I think is the interesting case for politics. Um, what political equality would mean is that they start with a sense of respect for each other and a recognition that each of them in principle has equal influence over the outcome. And so the trick is to persuade enough others um, to take one's position or to persuade each other about the questions around which one should uh, negotiate and make concessions. So um, I think political equality implies a kind of civility mm -hmm. of political practice. It doesn't imply that there's total agreement or total oneness of how people think about things. It's, it recognizes difference but facilitates that difference in a way that people treat each other as worthy of equal consideration. So it stands in contrast then to um, maybe on the one hand, for example, a person being uh, coercive over another person, right? In, in, in forcing them to take on their position because they have more power over them or they have more, more social standing or something. Um, and I guess it distinguishes itself then also from situations where in a sense where that conversation is meaningless because one person has, has the potential to influence a politician through some other means, right? right. Where, 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 they don't, where they don't require their, require their voice. Well, I think there's always, um, you know, an element of mobilizing power in politics and that's, that's not gonna go away. Mm -hmm. So I do think that that conversation does assume what you've just said, but it also assumes that 
mobilizing others and persuading others and finding bases of compromise, which are two distinct things, yeah. um, are absolutely critical to the situation. So it may be that one of those people, I don't know, the person on the left, has a lot fewer people behind her than the person on the right, that she's been unable to persuade yes. enough others yes. of the reasonableness of her position or yes. the rightness of her yes. position. Might, they might think it reasonable, but yes. they don't think it's correct um, on that particular policy yes. space. But then here's where we bring in democracy. If it's democracy, she may lose on that issue. But there will be another set of issues. And, and she was heard on this one. And she was heard on this one. Yes. Yes. And taken seriously, yes. and it was considered. Yes. And maybe even some of it was taken into the process itself. So she may not have gotten her way fully, but she might have got a little bit of it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And her, and I suppose the other element of it, another element of it is, is that just in the process of being able to share her views with with another with another person, she's able to express her distinction or her difference, right? And to be right. respected in, in in being different. Right. Yes. She, but losing is not the same as being disrespected. Yes. 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 Yeah. You were allowed on the whatever you. Sports analogies aren't always helpful, but you were allowed on the field, and you you had a you you were given a crack at it at least. Right. So there's all sorts of things right now that are, uh, you know, worrying for people who are thinking about the future of democracy. There's uh, increasing polarization in some countries, and much of that polarization is kind of affective. So it's about how people feel about each other. To take it right. back to the back to the conversation, you know, there's ongoing concerns about about corruption and the influence of money in politics. There's related concerns about the, the, the integrity of, of electoral systems generally, both to foreign interference and their capacity to actually function. Uh, and domestic interference. Domestic, yeah, domestic interference, yeah. And it's a concern in some countries more than, more than others, but it's a concern in places. And then there are these, I think, really serious concerns and legitimate ones about the capacity of democratic government to actually know what citizens want you know, and, and once they know what they want, to actually be able to act on it and to, and to, and to, uh, and to deliver policy. Which of those, I guess one way of asking the question is, which of those kind of worries you the most? But maybe a different way of asking it is, is you know, is there, is this, you've been a student of democracy for a long time, is it worse now than it was before? Are we at a, are we at a critical time? And if we are, what does is, what is the pursuit of political equality do in terms of repairing this? I mean, is it, is it an, an ideal that would actually take us to a better place rather than just acting as a, you know, a temporary corrective or salve to some of these serious challenges? Um, I think we are at a critical place. I don't think it's necessarily worse than it's ever been. But I think democracy is a work in progress, and so it periodically comes up to moments when it has to adapt and change or else decline. Um, I'll just take the history of the United States, which is not the only history I could take, but it's the one with which I'm the most fluent at the moment. Uh, you know, if you think about moments when there have been real cracks, this is in some ways less of a crack or an equal crack. Maybe I don't even know how to measure that to the era of McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. There were cracks before the Second World War. Um, there were people who feared the Bolsheviks were going to take over yes, and yes. all kinds yes. of things going on around that. There was the Civil War. Yes. I mean, we've had cracks yes. before. Uh, and we will have cracks. The, this crack, I believe, will ultimately get repaired, possibly not fast enough for well, our, all of our tastes. We, we live in a world where things have to happen fast. Yes. Um, but I think that will eventually get repaired. But if it does, and I think it will, there will be another crack one day. I mean, the history of any polity is a history of changing democracy, changing um, migrancy, changing ideas about what, who should be a citizen, yes. what issues should be part of the public yes. debate. And those are always going to create fractures, particularly if we have a commitment to a plurality of publics. Yes in our democracies and in yes. our polities. Yes. But isn't a worrying point in this is that when you look across the world, I guess there's, there's, there's two things that maybe seem different now than in, than in the past, two, maybe three. One is that you know, there, there, are, there are more, in a sense, legitimate competitors to democracy than there were before. 
You know, if, if you were looking back, if you were comparing democracies to China in the 1970s and 1980s, China didn't have a great case to make for itself as a system of government. You know, having now lifted a billion people out of poverty, it's 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 got some arguments on its side. Yeah. You know, I don't subscribe to them, but but it, no, but it's, right, right. You know, but, that's... but there's a there's a case there, right? There's a case there, um, and as much as you know, the United States has gone through fits and starts uh, in terms of how democratic it was, and and Canada has had its own challenges, and every country's had its own unique challenges. It feels like, and this might just be the bias of the president, but it feels like the the there are more crises in more places right now than there have been, uh, at, least in, at least in recent memory. So that's the second factor, right? You've got competitors, you've got real questions about the capacity of democratic states to, to compete, right? And then you have bigger existential problems than we've had, than we've had before. You know, like it must have been nice in a sense to, to run a democracy in the 1940s when you thought, well, we can just extend healthcare to everyone. You know, I mean, there were all these ambitious things we could do, and now we have the big, the really big thorny problems, right? Of, Aging societies, climate change, the fact we are having to rethink capitalism and how it's and how it's going to work. Is so it worse now than it was? I mean, some of those problems sound like the nineteen late nineteen forties and nineteen fifties, where there was also the threat of nuclear disaster, which you know is still there, but we don't think of it the same way. But I grew up in elementary school hiding under my desk yeah. periodically. No, no, we we wrestled it to the ground. Yeah. Yeah, in large part, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but that was a real existential yes. threat yes. that was as strong as climate change yes. is now. I mean, the yes. world could have blown up, and it yes. still could. I mean, that's it's not totally gone away. There are a lot yes. of rogues out there who yes. could could still make that happen. Um, in terms of competition, I mean. Some of this was myth that we later had dispelled, but you know, when I first learned as a child about the Soviet Union, I learned about the equality of women. Mm -hmm. I learned about uh, the fact that there were no big classes. Yes, yes. You know, no super rich and yes. super poor. Yes. I mean, that looked awfully good in a world of extreme poverty and extreme yes. wealth, yes. which was also true of the 1950s and 60s. Yes. Um, so, as it turns out, as, I, as we know, some of that was Soviet mythology, was very comp but it was very competitive on science, yes, for example, yes, and yes. it was responsive in yes. certain kinds of ways that the U.S. was not. And it was their aspiration, if nothing else. I mean, it was, right. and, and the aspirations themselves even mattered, right, for, That's right. for persuasion. So, you know, and Cuba was also mythic in some ways, and on some things not so. I mean, it did have the best medical care system in the world for a while. So even the, there was always competition, I think. Um, and then you go back into a longer go history and there was certainly competition. So were the traditional monarchies undemocratized better or some of the autocracies yes. better at serving the public in fact? Yes. Yes. So I think those issues keep coming up in different kinds of ways. I do think what has changed in the current period is that with the introduction of two things, one is uh, the, the environmental crisis and the existential crisis that climate change is causing. Mm -hmm. I think it, is comp it can be conquered. Um, I think there's some hope that it is going to be now for the first time we're beginning to see some hope in that dimension. But it is a, a real overhanging crisis, and it's something that's man and woman created in a different way than the nuclear. That was an yes. elite yes. creating yes. a technology. Yes. This is the public really has to stand up to yes. its politicians yes. and to its own, what it's doing. Yes. So it's a, different, it's a different kind of crisis in that sense. The other thing, of course, is social media. And we've always had different forms of media that have divided the public and have had their own followings. I mean, mm -hmm. Father Coughlin and yeah, the, yeah. Uh, or whoever. I mean, yeah. radio and and the Gutenberg Bible. I mean, you know, as soon as you started the printing press, yeah, um, you the began original, to the original the, social media. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. yeah, papyrus was actually yeah. before it. Yeah. But you begin in, you begin to divide the public yes. because people can create audiences yes. around uh, new forms of media. But the speed of modern technology, its manipulative capacities are at a level that we haven't known before. Yes. Not that the phenomenon is no, new, but the speed and the intensity of it and the level of it is different. And we're just beginning to figure out how we might combat that. Yes.
I have one last question for you. Um, there's a book re written recently by Ron Daniels. I don't know if you've seen it, but he's the president of Johns Hopkins called What Do Universities Owe Democracy? You spent your, most of your life in, in universities, teaching and researching and, and with, a, with a commitment to normative questions as well as the, the proper empirical investigation of them. But, and in, in your last stage of your career, running a, a center that is actually not committed to public engagement, but committed to groundbreaking research. Yeah. Sometimes it's kind of field setting research. But what's your, what's your you know, looking back now, what's your, what's your sense of what universities and I, in fact, I should note, you, you taught at a public university for a long, long time, and one of the world's great public universities, University of Washington. What's your, what's your sense of what universities owe democracy? I think they owe them a lot, and I think they're falling down at the job. And even, even the center that I ran, yes, we were doing, our commitment was to field-breaking research, but it was in the interest of ultimately serving the public that we were asking the deep questions that have to be asked and setting the research agendas that have to be set in order to get to the questions that policy has to confront and to, to, to confront well. Um, I think universities right now are not doing a great job at preparing students to operate in the world. They may be preparing them for a certain kind of job market, um, but not necessarily preparing them fully as citizens. I know lots of universities are experimenting with ways to deal with that. Yes. Stanford is, for example, I'm part of a, in the, in the winter I'll be teaching in the citizenship mm -hmm. course that they have introduced for all freshmen, mm -hmm. um, and in which a lot of different faculty are involved. So there's some efforts to, to, to sort of help create a better civic culture that I think universities have some responsibility for. But it's also thinking about, research has gotten the reward system, the research system at universities has gotten very distorted by certain kinds of, if you will, economic market principles about yes. you know getting paid really well, yes. about, and then certain ideas about what tenure is based on very narrow notions of what is a good place to publish and a good form of research. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying we should degra degrade our standards. I think we have to rethink our standards and rethink what good research and good dissemination of that research really amounts to. Um, and it requires that we not only reward people for the single authored article that adds a footnote to something in their narrow sense of discipline, um, which is what largely has happened in the past and is still continues to happen, but really think, think about what it is the university has responsibility to encourage in terms of research and teaching, and then provide rewards that are consistent with that as opposed to consistent with an old idea of scholarship and universities. It's very, it's very, very well put. There is this, uh, whatever, whatever our goals are as universities, we ask for those goals to be achieved by a bunch of academics working in isolation from each other, which is a curious way to pursue social goals. Absolutely. A very curious way. Thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you, Peter.